People aren't all playing from the same rule book. Journalists are under incredible time pressure to break stories, sometimes at the expense of accuracy and, in the client's eyes, defamatory. That's the point, to actually bring in specialist media lawyers. News is no longer governed by print deadlines and fixed news slots. Traditional media outlets have been challenged, but actually if you look closely they're all adapting their business models very effectively to meet the new world. Some of them are using social media to actually drive significant numbers of people back to their paper. I'm Kate Miller. I'm a strategic communications consultant at DRD Partnership. Traditionally, when you're dealing with outlets such as the BBC or you know, the Times the Guardian, you know, they're governed by their editor's codes. There's a set form of conduct and we have a relationship which is very well established. But when you're dealing with a range of different individuals, influencers, different platforms, different outlets, different geographies, those rules don't necessarily apply. Publicists are often on the front line when it's our own clients, the newspaper will come to us first. The advice has changed drastically. As the PRs, we go into the discussion with the journalist, often on background. We're trying to narrow the story as much as we can. Identify either the vulnerabilities, the inaccuracies, the wrongness within a piece, and look at various courses of action. Sometimes it then gets to a point that you've reached gridlock and, and the journalist is still determined to print something which actually is completely unacceptable. That's the point to actually bring in specialist media lawyers. It becomes a simultaneous journey down a road with client, publicist and lawyer in that case where all three of you will work through understanding what's going on here and decide your line of defence or potentially your many line of defences and your course of actions. Not everything is about immediately responding. Stories will morph in many different ways and therefore actually the job we have at that early point is not just looking what's under our nose, it's about preparing for where else something might go. I think it's always going to be a judgment call because on the one hand you've got the legal merits of the case and on the other hand you've got the reputational impact. There are instances where immediate legal action is appropriate and indeed required. For instance, if there's going to be an immediate breach of privacy, if the damage is so significant an injunction perhaps needs to be sought or you need to be seen to be defending your reputation and correcting a falsehood. However, there are situations where taking immediate legal action can seem oppressive and, and indeed be counterproductive. You need to be aware of, are you going to be placed in the role of Goliath versus David? And that could actually, in fact, backfire on you. Perception is a really key element of any legal strategy. And that's why we'd work very closely with communications advisors to understand whether taking legal action is the right approach. There is a danger that you actually draw more attention to a matter, what people call the Streisand effect, where Barbara Streisand took legal action against someone who took an aerial photograph of her house. Now, at the time that she started the legal action, there'd only been six downloads of the image, but by the time the action got to court, there'd been hundreds of thousands of people who'd downloaded and had a look at her image, and in the end, the case was actually dismissed. So it, it sort of completely backfired. One of the key questions for a client when determining whether to engage with online content is not only whether it's unlawful, but also whether it's actually causing damage to them and what the benefits of taking action might be. We've recently worked on a case for a very senior executive who was subject to a sustained online campaign operated mainly through Twitter. Ultimately, he felt there was no alternative but to take legal action. And the context for that was that the individual poster on Twitter had reputable journalists as his followers and had an ostensible layer of credibility because of past employment. In reality, the allegations that he was making about the client were completely unsubstantiated and frankly wild and, and irrational. But that didn't necessarily prevent the media from picking them up and reporting them. In that scenario, you are left ultimately with no alternative but to refer the matter to the courts 
and obtain a result for the client which involves a positive judgment in their favour, which the client can then rely upon, essentially a vindication of their reputation. People on a day-to-day -day basis don't talk about shields of privacy and don't talk about expectancy of privacy. Those are just rights that we expect. Someone can see someone that they recognize as famous, for you know, want of a better word, doing something very private with their family, take a video of it and post it on their social media and their intention is good. Their intention is not malicious, their intention is not an invasion. But the understanding of the second half of that, that actually you're now photographing somebody's minor children or you're photographing someone's private partner is not necessarily acceptable. The law provides that every citizen has a right to a family and private life, whether you're a high profile person or just an unknown ordinary citizen. But this right is balanced against the press's freedom of expression. A lot of people in public domain accept that there is part that they will be photographed. I think there is a very big difference in posing for a photograph and that being used and being snapped in a place where you're not expecting it. The intrusion is twofold. The intrusion is the person actually doing it to you. And the second level of that is when a newspaper or a media or an outlet decides to publish it. There are far more resources than people know about that you can put into place to say this isn't okay. If you've got a client who is in the public domain who gets engaged to someone who isn't in the public domain, that exposure to that person and the intrusion into their lives is, and this isn't an awful thing, it's a celebratory moment, but it's just not a public celebratory moment, and yet the partner's family will be doorstopped. And they'll be smartly doorstopped as well. I mean, that's the thing is, you know, you'll have people from the newspapers turning up at the door and saying, isn't it wonderful news? We're so happy. We want to celebrate the relationship. Not realizing that in giving that conversation or in giving some sort of approval for it, they're automatically losing their own shield of privacy. Preemptively, with many of the clients that we work with, we will have conversations way before any of this. Our conversations will be with people who don't have children in advance of maintaining your shield of privacy now will protect you for the things you're not even thinking about in 10 years' time. It's really important to get a media expert who really understands media law, defamation and the respective appetites of the various publications to advise on this because otherwise it can indeed be very counterproductive. As a team we operate very much with a holistic approach to reputation risk. We don't simply assess the legalities of a situation. We'll consider the context for the client and devise a strategy based on that. The advantage that we have if we're working alongside the lawyers is as the PRs we can engage in a dialogue and a conversation. It can change the direction of the stories and sometimes indeed it can, it can stop the story altogether. 